So today we're going to talk about databases. I'll cover everything you need to know about databases. Well, I say that tongue in cheek. But everything from the 312 side that you need to know about databases. And when it comes to like looking up uh, syntax for databases, uh, how to interact with it. Uh, like how to interact with the database, it'll be finding tutorials and uh, getting that exact syntax that you want. Uh, but I'll show you how to run the database, how to connect to it, and how to get to the point where you're sending statements to the database. And then once it, once I get you to that point, it'll be just like uh, HTML, CSS, those topics. I'll just say, you know, there's tons of resources out there. You can find how to insert into it, get thing, get data out of it, and do any uh, if you want to do anything more advanced, how to do those things. Wednesday will be examples. I'll uh, spin up some. I'll spin up some Docker containers, uh, connect to a database, and everything. And then I think Friday, I, I, we're not going to need two lectures full of database examples. You'll get it probably by today, uh, Wednesday. Uh, you'll definitely get it. Um, and then Friday, I'm going to take that time. This is my intent, you know, subject to change, of course, and talk about the project and specifically the reports for the project. So I'll take a library and then dive into the code of that library and show you what we expect for those reports. And then, of course, any questions, if you have any questions about the project especially, I mean, ask them at any time, but especially on Friday. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, that lecture will be, uh, you know, I'll play off of you whatever kind of questions you have. I'll uh, do what I can to get you up and running with the project because I'm starting to get more and more questions and we have a little bit of room in the schedule this week to be able to talk about that. Anybody have any questions right now about, I guess, anything? Yeah. We're going to use a local database or like an online database? We're going to use Docker Compose to run a local database. Okay. Lights. Oh, my, my phone. But yes, I have questions. Oh, that's the wrong button. Discord. All right, let's talk about some databases. I have Discord, the lecture channel is always open if you have questions. All right, let's talk about databases. So you've at this point, you've at least messed with the database at some level in some course. I, I feel like I can confidently say that, unless uh, maybe you transferred in and, you know, I don't know, maybe you took a different path. Uh, maybe you were allowed to avoid databases. Uh, either way, we're going to cover things from uh, basically the ground up anyway. Um, but I expect if you did everything at UB in 115 at the least, you messed with SQLite with Python. At the very least, I, I think you've been exposed to that. Um, but let's talk about what databases are. A database is a program that's going to run on your program, or on your machine, uh, or potentially on a remote server. We'll see running them on our machines in this class. And it's going to handle all of the file I.O. for us, storing our information. And But importantly, it's going to run as a separate process, and we're going to communicate to it communicate with it via a TCP socket. So a database is a server just like the servers we're writing. It's going to listen on a specific TCP socket, and we're going to send it database queries to be able to store and retrieve and process our data. So it's very similar to a WebSocket server in that it starts with a TCP socket. But in this class, we're not going to mess with databases at the TCP level. Uh, you know, There are other ways, other courses that are um, That'll cover that kind of stuff. Actually, I don't know if they start with TCP sockets in the, any of the database courses here. Um, but, uh, but we're not concerned with the low-level details of the database. We're worried about web servers. So uh, we're going to use libraries to abstract that. But a database does do the same thing as a web server. Opens up a TCP socket server and listens for connections and then communicates via that TCP connection. The database will handle all of the file I.O. All that stuff that um, that if you're not using a database, you might just save files to disk and then retrieve those data, those files. You might save like CSV files or JSON files or something like that. 
Uh, database is going to do all that for us, handle all the low-level stuff, and optimize the crap out of everything. Opti uh, databases, there's tons of research, tons of development that go into these databases to optimize every single operation you do on these things. Uh, the biggest reason to use databases, at least in my opinion, is to take advantage of those optimizations. These people, you know, teams of engineers have spent so long optimizing and building this really nice software. Let's take advantage of that. So when we have information to store, we're going to send it to the database, use that really uh, nice, sophisticated software, and have it do all of the, the low-level stuff and actually save that information to disk instead of saving files to disk on our own. So, and uh, I guess it's worth mentioning. Um, this one apply to, I really want to talk, I, yeah, I think I should. Uh, this doesn't really apply to like uh, files. Uh, when I say file IO, that might be uh, a little bit misleading. Like if you have an image file, you would still save image files the way that we do now, the way that you did in homework two. You'd take that image file, save it to disk, and just save it as a file on your hard drive. The hard drive and the, the file system that's going to be just fine for that. The database can't really optimize that that much. There's not much to do. It's just a whole bunch of bytes that need to be stored. The database is going to help us when we have some structure to that information. That's where we're going to use the database. So even storing images, typically you would store the image on disk the way you did with homework two. And then in the database, you would attach that image to a record somehow. Like maybe for your project, it's a profile picture for a specific user. In the database, you would say, this user's profile picture is this file name. And then whenever you need to retrieve their picture, you would go, go to the database, say, what's the image for this user? That, what's the profile image for this user? Get the file name, and then read the file name, file from disk based on that name. So it's not going to take all of our file I.O., but any structured data. You have millions of users, and you want to store them all in a, 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 some way. That's the database. But then the actual files themselves usually just store them somewhere else. Uh, the database can't optimize that um, as much as we'd. We can't get more optimization out of that than the file system itself. That's just a bunch of bytes. There's, what's the database even going to do? Just a bunch of bytes uh, that need to be stored. So we're going to look at two different databases. Uh, for your homework, you can pick one of these. You know, If you choose a third one, if there's a third one you want to use, as long as you use it with the same Structure is, of course, using Docker Compose, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to stop you, but these are the two that I'm going to explicitly at least mention and uh, present to you as, as options. Uh, if you want to use like Postgres or, uh, or something else, anything else, um, go for it. Um, but these are the two that I'll introduce, and I recommend just sticking with one of these two. They're, they're just as good for our purposes. Um, but I do want to cover these two because they do behave very differently. Most databases you're going to find are going to behave like one or the other, either a structured database or an unstructured document store. Uh, those are the two uh, primary flavors of database. There are others, but these are the two primary flavors that you're going to encounter out there in the world. So MySQL, which is going to implement SQL, it's going to speak SQL queries. Uh, there are a lot of databases that speak SQL. MySQL is just one of them. I believe it is the most popular, it's the most used out there uh, in industry. And then MongoDB, which is going to be a document store. It's a very unstructured way of storing information. So let's start with MySQL. MySQL, if you want to use these locally, you'll go to the internet, Google MySQL, go to their download page, download, install the software, and run it in the background. So MySQL will be running on your machine. It'll open up a TCP, uh, a TCP server that listens on port 3306 by default. And it'll just listen for TCP connections that, uh, through which it'll communicate SQL statements. So once this is installed and running on your machine, then in your code, you're going to pull in a library. You are allowed to use. Uh, libraries to connect to your databases, both in your homeworks and your projects. Pull in a library that's going to connect to that database. And then once you're connected, start sending it statements. Start sending it uh, either SQL statements or MongoDB statements. Start sending those uh, statements and queries and communicate with the database. Uh, so I'm going to, you're never going to touch that TCP level for databases. 
that library, as long as the library is not writing the statements and queries for you, it's allowed for the homeworks and the projects uh, without a report on the project. Just a heads up for the project, if you're using a library that's writing the queries for you, then you need a report. So if you're using an ORM for your project, you do need a report for that. So just a heads up on that if you're, um, if you're starting to plan what technologies you're using for the project. So with MySQL, here's an example, it's in Scala. Uh, once you want to connect to your MySQL database, you need three pieces of information. You need the URL for the database, you need your username, and you need your password. If you install MySQL locally, during the installation process, it's gonna ask you to create a, a, at the very least, a password for the root user, or you can set up a separate account that's a non-root account, and set up a username and password. When you go through that installation process, just make sure you remember what those, those are, what you set your password at, et cetera. If you created a, a separate user, make sure you remember what that username is. Because uh, you're going to need to put them in your code. You're going to need those pieces of information when you connect. If you don't, don't forgot your password, uh, you're not going to be able to connect to it. Uh, at that point, probably just uninstall and reinstall MySQL. I have this very secure password. Don't use this as a password. I only use that as an example in the slides. Obviously, uh, don't use such an insecure password. And speaking of passwords, uh, this, you know, we're not using, I'm not requiring version control for the, um, for this course. Oh, I am for the, the project. I guess this will come into play. Yeah, for the, for the homework, though, this doesn't come into play. But for the project, this would. When we have a password like this, you never want to hard code your password into your code like this. So this example, this would be a terrible example. Aside from just having a weak password, if I check this into version control, now everybody with access to that repo has access to my password and can access my database, uh, assuming I'm open to outside connections and, and some other things. There are other layers of protection we can have here. Uh, but everybody's going to have my database password, my database username and password, if I check this into version control. Anyone, at least with access to the repo, and if it's a public GitHub repo, everybody on the planet has access to that information and can potentially hack into my database. I wouldn't even call it hacking at that point. They're just going to log in normally. So this is a bad thing. Uh, this is, if we've heard of the Equifax, if you've heard of that, which uh, I'm sure you probably all have by now. Um, of course, it's getting pretty dated. That happened quite a while ago now. It's starting to be an old example. Um, but they leaked um, hundreds of millions, I think it was, of financial information, people's financial information. They're a credit scoring uh, company, and they just leaked all kinds of uh, information. Jeez, um, uh, I can't even think of it. Social security numbers and all the financial information of a bunch of people. How this hack, I, I can't even call it a hack, but how this leak occurred was that they just used the default password of some open source library that they were using. It wasn't MySQL, but it's related to this, uh, to the security talk, is uh, they just used some third party library which allowed their devs to access the data. Like uh, if you have ever used anything to like visualize your database data, uh, to be able to look through the tables, look through all the data that's in there. It was, uh, it was something like that to be able to look at all of the data at Equifax but they also had it set up to allow remote connections so devs could, uh, could access the data from home, from wherever they were. They would be able to access that information and visualize it through this nice interface because they wanted to look at the data in a pretty way. You know, who doesn't? Well, that library had a default password and they never changed it. So everybody had access to that information. And, you know, a hacker, I believe it, if I'm remembering right, I believe it was a white hat hacker who was like, hey, Equifax, use the default password. Like, maybe don't do that. Equifax didn't listen, because of course. Uh, and then eventually the data was leaked. Um, and this is, I talked about this, I feel like just last week. Um, it's not that people are always looking for vulnerabilities like this, but especially if you're using the default password for a, a well-known open source library, there are gonna be bots that are just scanning IPs for that specific vulnerability. They're just going to look for whatever that library enables. Maybe that library listens on a specific default port with a default username and a default password. They're just going to scan 
IP addresses until the bot says, hey, we got one, and then a human comes in and starts stealing data. Uh, so if you have an open source library like that with a default password, you, know, you might get hacked. Not because somebody's targeting you, but because they're just targeting anybody with that vulnerability. So this is something that we need to think about, we need to be aware of. Like if your password's admin or root or anything common or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you have a MySQL server like this, like this MySQL server might get hacked just by people scanning for weak passwords with the username of root. Uh, even if I don't leak my password myself, they might hack this with a bot. Uh, so the, the solution to this, I have examples on Wednesday, is to set that password in an environment variable on your machine and then, uh, and then just read the environment variable in your code. So you never actually hard code your password. Uh, again, for your homework, there's no real way for you to do this because when you submit the Autolab, your password has to be somewhere in that code. Uh, we can't read the environment variables on your local machine, of course. Uh, but if you go to, to plan in production, which sadly I, I scrapped that requirement for the project. It, it was like having you deploy and have your apps uh, available to the internet, and I highly encourage you to do that still. Uh, but I'm not going to require it because I can't find a good, clean way to do that without costing you money. So, um, uh, but I'll give examples if you're interested. I'll give examples in lectures and uh, of how to do that. But when you go to deploy, that's where you would really, uh, you would deploy and then set your environment variable on that machine, on the production server. And then all your code just reads that environment variable. So then your password is never checked into version control, but all of your code works just by reading that environment variable in what, wherever you're testing, either on your laptop or in production, you're gonna set that environment variable to the appropriate password, and then you're able to connect to the database. So that's the like go-to solution to not checking a password into version control. And once we're connected, it's SQL after that. Uh, just like with HTML and CSS, W3Schools has a nice SQL tutorial. Go check it out, learn all kinds of SQL statements you need. Uh, for this course, for your homework and project, really all we need is insert, update, uh, delete, and retrieve. Uh, so s selecting from a table, creating a table, inserting into the table, update, which is you replace insert with update. I, oh, I might be, I have to check the syntax on that. Um, and select. Uh, we'll, we'll use very little of SQL's actual power. Uh, we're just using that, the database to store information, retrieve that information mostly. Uh, so here's an example. I'm going to create a table. On server startup, you should create all your tables. Use this if not exists, and then you can run this every time you start up your, your server. You're going to create the table if it doesn't exist. So it's the first time that you ran your server on a specific machine. It's going to create that table. If not, don't do anything. Without this if not exists, if you just have like create table players, the second time you run that code, it's going to crash. I don't like this behavior. I wish it just like, you know, didn't do anything. Uh, but if you don't have that if not exist, MySQL will say, that table already exists, and then just blow up. Just explode your program, things crash. Uh, so if you add this if not exists, it's going to say only create this table if it doesn't already exist. If it already exists, don't do anything. And then once you have your table, so, so first you're connecting. You have this connection. You're going to create a statement and execute it. And then if we're handling user data, we're going to create a prepared statement and execute that prepared statement, send that to, to the database. So here, we're going, we want to send this statement to the database to store a specific record into the player's table. We're not going to use string concatenation here. I assume, maybe I should ask, uh, who's familiar with this concept? You've seen this in at least one class before? Handful of you, not everyone. Is everyone else not paying attention or uh, or hasn't seen it? I should have asked the inverse. But, well, let me just explain it. Uh, so 
since I didn't see all hands go up. Uh, so we want to insert these values into the table. This is the SQL statement that we want to say. Insert into this table the values, these two values. Now we could use string concatenation right here and take users, take values from the user and splice them directly into our SQL statement with just good old fashioned string concatenation, build our statement and then send the statement to the database. This is extremely dangerous and this is something we will look for in both the, uh, I think I forgot to add it to the testing procedures for the homework to be honest, but it is something we'll look at uh, for the project. If I don't have it in the testing procedures, I don't think it's fair to, to test on it, unfortunately. Uh, and I, I missed that one. Uh, I'll have to add it for homework four to make sure. Uh, but for the project, for sure, uh, where I just have a blanket statement, if we covered it in class, then you're responsible for it. Um, if you use string concatenation here, that's what your user can enter into that field. So say you have like a search field and you say type in something and we'll search it for you and we'll splice it into a select from search uh, database, whatever. And the user decides they're going to search this string. They're going to end whatever SQL statement that we have right here, they're gonna end our SQL statement and then they're gonna type whatever SQL they want after that. Since we're using string concatenation, my SQL is gonna be like, oh yeah, that's SQL. I'm going to run that because that's SQL. This is what we call SQL injection, very similar to HTML injection, JavaScript injection. This is where a user can inject their own SQL statements into your database. And they can do things like just drop the table, you know, purely malicious, just purely watch the world burn. Or they can do something a little more devious and try to uh, change this to a select star from players, select star from users get all of the information from your table, just have the database cough up all of the information. They could try to get potentially like the admin password for the server, log into your server and just do whatever they want after that. Uh, this is a very scary attack. Uh, if if a server is vulnerable to MySQL, uh, to SQL injection attacks, you really have no security. Somebody who knows what they're doing is going to just control your entire server. This is a very, very bad attack luckily has a pretty simple solution, use prepared statements. So instead of using string concatenation here, and every, every MySQL library, every SQL library I've seen uses this syntax, uh, we're gonna put these question marks in there, which are placeholders for the values that we want to insert into this statement. And then we're going to add those statements later. Uh, the syntax is a little different depending on which language, which library you're using, but you always have these question marks. You see these question marks in your statement? If I see these question marks in your statement, I know you're using prepared statements. And then you're going to inject that data later. So say, you know, I have these hard-coded here, but assume these are coming from the user. Those values are now treated as actual values. When these are injected into the statement, they're only handled as values. It's pure strings or pure int. They're not interpreted as SQL statements. Similar to our HTML, how we said, handle this as just text. Don't render it as HTML. We're doing the same thing here. Use these as just values. Do not parse them as SQL statements. Do not parse them as SQL statements. Uh, and now we're mostly, I mean, there are still successful SQL injection attacks out there, even using prepared statements. But for our purposes, that's getting way sophisticated. Uh, we'll be uh, working with really, really advanced hackers who are exploiting some other vulnerability that you left open to be able to get their SQL injected. Uh, with prepared statements, you're preventing the vast majority of all attacks, especially any uh, non-sophisticated hacker, preventing the, those attacks. Unless you did something silly somewhere else, of course. And open the door for them some other way. And when we want to pull information, we use the select statement. Select stars, the wildcard just says, give me everything from some table. It's going to give us all of the information that we want. Depending on your language, you're going to get the information returned in, in different ways. Uh, Scala returns a result set that we can iterate over and pull all the information out of and then process it however we want to process it after that. 
Any questions so far? Everyone feeling good about this? Yeah. Um, when we're using MySQL, will we be like you think we'll need to have multiple tables? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you'll need multiple tables. Like if you were using MySQL in homework two, you'd need a table to store all the image names. Uh, mapping the image name to the file name, or at least just a, a table with, with just the file names. Another one to store your uh, cross-site uh, tokens, your CR CSRF tokens. Um, another one for the chat messages. Like just for each type of data, each application, you would have a different table. So like in a scenario like when we're programming, anytime we want to say like a global variable or something that we want to access throughout, and like that we're storing like persistent data, if it needs to persist, oh yeah, I should have I should have had a, an intro talking about that. The database is when we want persistent data. That's the reason to use a database. So whenever we want data that persists through a server restart, that's when we would use a database. So if we have like uh, like something that keeps track of the users that are connected to us and which ones are WebSocket connections, for example. That's not going to persist through a restart anyway, because all those TCP connections will be severed. So that wouldn't go in a database. We wouldn't, we wouldn't care to put that in the database. Um, but any like chat history, images that were uploaded, the image file names at least, anything that uh, the tokens, like if somebody requested your site, you refresh the uh, restart of the server, and then somebody's submitting the form with that uh, cross-site request forgery token. We want that token to still be valid, so that needs to persist. So that would go in our database. User accounts, um, like uh, we have the user API for homework three, that's got to persist. All the chat messages through the websockets that has to persist. Um, anything that you want to persist through a restart, it's going to go in the database because it has to be stored on disk. So the the difference is it can't be stored in RAM. It has to be stored on disk. Because RAM is going to get wiped out once our and once our program ends, the stack and heap, all that stuff gets blown away. But everything on disk that persists. So we're replacing disk aside from like just saving files. We're replacing that with databases. Once we get to uh, you know, once you get to deploying real apps out there in the world, you're not just going to be like, I'm going to save a file with a list of all my file names, all my image names. You don't do that anymore. Uh, in the real world, it's it's just. <laughs> is there like a scenario that, like you were talking about, like client works, right? Uh, is there a scenario that you still want to put in like database if it was like large in size, like if there was like a lot of, if you have a lot of clients, uh, yeah. or it would still be something you could use? Potentially, I don't want to say no to that. Potentially, there would be a reason why non-persistent data you'd want in the database to take advantage of that optimization. Um, but since those will get wiped out, like every time the server restarts, you would have to delete everything from that table because all those connections are invalid. Be really updating that a lot. Uh, potentially, I don't want to say no because maybe that is more efficient. Um, but since you don't want it to persist, you would lose efficiency every time you restart. But yeah, I guess if you have like millions of concurrent users. You might want that in the database. I don't know. It's an interesting one. All right, so, so SQL is based on rows and columns. We have to create a table, we created a player's table, and then we insert information to it, retrieve data from it. Uh, very based on rows and columns, very structured. This is very similar to CSV, except with CSV, we had to only use text. It was only a text format. We couldn't encode numbers. We could just put numbers in our CSV, read them as strings, and then convert them to numbers later. Uh, but we had to do that in our code. CSV, the format, is only going to be text files. Uh, so SQL is a little more flexible than CSV, but it's very similar structure. So what happens if we want like an array or a key value store? SQL's answer is to use separate tables for these. Like say you have users, and for each user you want to store a list of anything for that user, any data structure at all. Uh, you would create two separate tables, and then uh, say you want to store, uh, say you want to remember which uh, a list of the files uploaded by a particular user. So for e you have a users table which stores all of your users, and then for each user, uh, for each user you want that array, uh, 
what you're going to do is create another table with all of the uploaded images with the user ID and the image uh, in that, uh, the image name in that separate table. And then you would use joins. You would say, give me, you know, join these two tables based on this user ID and give me this user with all of their images that are uploaded. Uh, it's not crazy uh, complex, but it does add a level of complexity uh, that requires some study, requires some thinking. Not too much, it's not too crazy. If you took a database class, you're like, oh yeah, we did that like week two. It's not that bad, uh, but week two means a week. You know, that's some, some thinking. Um, but it's not terrible. Or uh, MongoDB is a much simpler solution. I won't say it's the best solution, but it's a simpler solution to this uh, if you run into this. So let's talk about MongoDB. That's my segue into MongoDB. So MongoDB is the other database I want to talk about. It's still going to run as a separate piece of software, a separate process on our machines. Instead of 3306, 27017 is going to be the default port for MongoDB. And these port numbers, by the way, they're just made up. Like when the, my SQL developers, they were sitting down and saying, what's our port number going to be? Somebody I like the number 33, and somebody else was like, I like the number, six. I don't know how exactly it happened, but they, they just picked some port number. Uh, the MongoDB developers, they picked 27017. Maybe somebody liked the number 27, somebody else liked the number 17. 2717 was already taken, so they said, let's just put a zero in the middle there. I don't know. The point is, these port numbers are arbitrary, but once they like claim a port number, like don't use 27017 for your app. For example, that's MongoDB's port number. They kind of they claimed it, uh, so that's what they're going to they're going to use. So by default, it runs on 27017. And if you just connect to a MongoDB database, if you just say connect to localhost, it's going to default to that port. You can override the port if you want. There's no usually no good reason to unless you have two MongoDB databases on the same machine, which you know maybe that's your use case. Um, but once you're connected, this is going to be a document-based structure which is very similar to JSON structure. So like most of you in this class, using either Python or JavaScript, MongoDB is going to mimic your dictionaries, objects, arrays, and lists directly. You just throw your data into a Mongo database, and it just stores your data. Makes things a bit simpler if you don't have this uh, table structure uh, kind of naturally in your code. So for example, if I have a MongoDB database that I'm connected to, I'm going to pull a collection. Do I have a uh, I don't think I do talk about that stuff. So let me, let me spend some time on the slide and, and talk about things. So a collection in MongoDB is like a table in MySQL. So a collection is like a table, except there's no defined columns. You just create a collection, and you throw whatever the hell you want in there. You just stuff any documents, which in JSON would be objects. Just throw any documents in there. Or if you throw an array or a list in there of documents, it's going to store each document as a separate document. Of course, we, instead of insert one, we would use insert many in that case. So a collection is going to store these documents, which are effectively JSON objects, very similar structure. It actually uses BSON, um, but it's the same structure. For our purposes, these are JSON objects. So I'm going to throw this object into this collection. I didn't do any setup for the collection. So there's no like uh, equivalent to create table in MySQL. You just throw information into the collection. If that collection doesn't exist, MongoDB is going to create it for you. So you just throw things into the collection, and then uh, the collection will exist after that. So I'm going to throw this object in there. And if I want to retrieve documents uh, or objects from a collection, I'm going to use find. And I'm going to give it an object where I'm filtering based on the values at certain keys. So with this query, this is saying find all of the records 
with a key of, called username with a value of heart lock. So give me all my records is what I'm saying here. If I want all of them, like the equivalent of a select star, just give it an empty object and you'll get every record in that collection. So a bit different syntax, but we can do the same stuff that we do with SQL. And again, I'll defer to, uh, uh, I think W3Schools has a nice MongoDB tutorial as well. I'll defer to that for, uh, for more specific functionality. Oh, that is all I have on MongoDB. Any questions on MongoDB? I kind of ripped through that quick. Uh, I'll give more specifics on Wednesday when I go through examples. You'll see all the connection code and everything. Uh, by default, MongoDB doesn't use any username and password, so you just give it the host, the URL, and that's it. MongoDB also, by default, blocks outside connections. So the fact that you don't need a username and password to connect to it, uh, as long as you're not opening up to outside connections, to remote connections, it's really nothing to worry about. If they have access to your machine, they can access the MongoDB database, but if they have access to your machine, I'd say you're already screwed. Uh, there, there's, you know, they already have access to your machine. What are you doing? You have no security. Yeah. Does uh, Docker work? Is this only doing, does like Docker do remote to containers or? Uh, between containers, you, it'll allow connections. Okay. Uh, so MongoDB is very unstructured. You just throw documents in there and then you retrieve documents based on key values or just uh, an empty dictionary to get everything. Very unstructured, very loose. There's no, uh, no structure enforced. If you throw in one record that looks like this, and then another record with player name, Mario, score 10, like we had in the other example, MongoDB is just going to be like, yeah, sure. And you're going to have both those records in the same collection, even though they're completely different structures, completely different objects. Uh, MongoDB just doesn't care. So with MongoDB, it's really up to you to enforce any type of structure that you want because uh, the database doesn't do it for you by design. Um, SQL is very structured. That's what the S stands for. You have to pre-build these tables. You have to say, I have a table named this with these columns, and then you have to adhere to that structure as you're inserting information. This makes SQL very fast because based on, that, based on those tables, SQL can optimize significantly can get incredible performance out of SQL because of that structure. Uh, but it does have some rigidity to it. So my hot take, MongoDB is really great for prototyping. When you don't know what your app's gonna look like or what the structure of your data is gonna look like, things are changing rapidly, you're adding features, you may be removing features, uh, things are changing fast. I like MongoDB for those purposes because I don't have to worry about my database too much. I just start using the database in a different way every time I want to make a change. And the database doesn't uh, get in the way at all. Once your schemas settle down and you know the structure of your data that you're going to be storing, switch to SQL. Once you get out of that prototyping phase, switch to SQL and take advantage of that sweet, sweet optimization. Take advantage of that speed because you're never going to get that kind of optimization, that kind of performance from MongoDB. MongoDB or any unstructured database simply can't offer you that kind of performance because there's no structure to really follow. There's no structure to take advantage of with those optimizations. Yeah. To have... Uh, to have different collections. So you would, like uh, for each use case, you would have a different collection to keep your data separate. You wouldn't want to throw everything in, in one uh, collection. Uh, so you would create multiple collections for that. Just like your tables, except when it comes to like users and storing a list of all the images that they've uploaded, you can have all that in one collection now because you can just have an array as one of your, uh, one of your values for one of your keys. You can just store it all in one object. Um, so you wouldn't have multiple tables like that where you need multiple tables in SQL. But if you have two different use cases, like user accounts and chat history, you create two separate collections for that. Docker Compose, which we won't be able to get through all of this today, probably in the next eight minutes. 
Um, we're just fine because we have some flexibility in the schedule this week. I'll just cover the rest of the slides. On, I'll do what I can today. But uh, whatever I don't get to, we'll cover at the beginning of Wednesday and then jump into the examples. So Docker Compose. So here's, here's the problem that we're facing. We have two applications that need to run to run our server now. We need our database running and we need our app running. And the two are going to communicate through TCP connections and our app is going to be open to TCP connections to be able to communicate with clients. With Docker, we're just running one app. We're, we're running the, uh, building a, an image based on a Docker file and then creating containers based on that image, uh, which is nice, but what happens when we need a database too? It gets uh, a little trickier. So for that, we're going to use Docker Compose, which is another piece of software you'll install. It's a lot easier for those of you with Windows, it's a lot easier than installing Docker itself, because you already have you know, the WSL set up and everything. You just install Docker Compose. Uh, for the rest of us, it's just as easy as installing Docker, just uh, you know, sudo apt-get or, or whatever you're using uh, for a package manager and install Docker Compose. With Docker Compose, we're gonna create a docker compose.yaml file and we're going to use that to be able to create multiple containers. So we're going to create a database container, have a database running in a container, and also create a container for our app like we have been. And Docker Compose is going to create both of them in a way that those containers can communicate with each other and effectively form one single app through multiple containers. Very powerful tool. Very nice to have. And here's a Docker Compose file that we'll take a look at. So this is going to create an image for a Mongo database, and also my app. And I want to go through this line by line. Actually, I think I can get through this today. So first, we're going to specify the version of Docker Compose. If you always use 3.3, it's fine. Um, the, I, there's probably a later version now. You want to use the latest version. Uh, I doubt it's going to change any of the syntax, but if there's some feature that you want that just came out with the latest version of Docker Compose, knock yourself up, change the version number. Um, but that needs to be present in the docker compose.yaml file. You need the version of docker compose. So docker compose knows how to read this file, knows what to look for in the file. And next we're going to have a list of services. By the way, this is YAML format. Uh, it's, uh, the indentation is meaningful. This is a services data structure with two values in it. Mongo has a value image, app has values, build, environment, and ports. And each time we indent, those are all part of that, uh, that piece of information, that uh, structure, I don't, the part of that key is the way I usually say it. I don't know if there's a, a more correct term. Uh, but services, under services, we're going to list all of the containers that we want to run for this app. So under services, I have Mongo and app. These are the two services that I want to run. Each one of them will get its own container and run in a separate brand new container that we're building through this. What we name these containers, it's very important to remember. Whatever we name these containers, and these names have no true meaning, I can name these whatever I want. I can name the first one my super awesome database container. Um, but whatever we name these, we have to remember because this is how we're going to specify which container we want to communicate to. These are effectively the host names for each of the containers when we want to communicate between them. And the host name is how we're going to specify. Uh, or, uh, and Docker Compose is going to resolve these host names to the appropriate container whenever we use them. For Mongo, we're not going to write a Docker file. Uh, we effectively have a one line Docker file here that says from Mongo 4.2.5. For my case, again, if you want to change the version number, whatever, uh, go for it. Um, but we're, we're going to specify the image just like this. Same exact thing as having a one line Docker file that just starts with that image and does nothing. It adds nothing else to it. If you want to create a Docker file and add things to it, go for it. This is all you need, though, is specifying the image. And same for MySQL, there's a MySQL Docker image uh, they can specify. But with MySQL, when I show you that example on Wednesday, there are some environment variables that we want to set to get the right username and password in our MySQL image. For our app, we're going to specify the build. This is the 
directory that contains the Docker file for this container. This is the same exact thing, what I have here, this is the same exact thing as when you build using Docker without Docker Compose, and you have that trailing dot that says, look in this directory for a Docker file. We're doing the same thing here. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put this Docker Compose.yaml file in the same directory as my Docker file, the root directory of my project, and I'm gonna say, look in this directory for a Docker file and build with that Docker file. I'm gonna specify any environment variables that I wanna set. Uh, with the environment, uh, with environment, and then a list of any environment variables with their values specified. There's one big problem that we're gonna face with this. This is my favorite solution. It's nice, simple, it's pretty clean. But there's one big problem we're gonna face is Docker Compose is going to start both of these containers and run them effectively simultaneously, um, but concurrently. It's going to spin up both of these containers. So one of the first things in our app, one of the first things our app is going to do is connect to the database. Well, if they're spinning up concurrently and the database is still going through this lengthy startup script, our app is gonna to try to connect to the database before it's done starting and before it's listening for TCP connections. And that's bad that everything breaks after that. If your app is connecting to a database that doesn't exist, that's not running. So we need to wait for the database to be running before we connect to it. I'm using this solution from GitHub user UFO Scout. It has a really nice solution. You can go to this repo. Uh, you can go to this repo and check it out. Check out uh, any documentation and, and stuff about it. Um, we're going to install this, or download it rather. And then we're going to call this slash wait, which is the command that we got from GitHub. Slash wait is going to read any environment variables, any variables in the wait host, and you can give this multiple hosts if you have a more complex application. Uh, but it's gonna look for this wait host environment variable and then wait for that host to be listening for TCP connections before exiting. And once it exits, it'll go to the second command, which is running my app. So I'm waiting for the host, Mongo, to be listening to TCP connections on 27017. That host is going to be this host. I'm gonna wait for that to be spinning uh, to be spun up before starting my app. If you have a different way you want to use to do this, be my guest. I like this one. This is my favorite way. If you just want to use this one and keep things easy, go for it. And finally, ports. This is just like when we do dash publish or dash p, and we're mapping a local port to a specific port. For your homework, make sure you're mapping 8080 to your app port. If you keep your app port at 8000, 8080 to 8000, make sure you're listening on that. Because when we run your Docker Compose, uh, we're no longer able to specify a local port because you have it right hard-coded into your Docker Compose. So please use 8080 for your homework. Uh, it's specified in the homework as well. And when you connect to Mongo or MySQL, instead of using localhost, make sure you use that host name you specified in your Docker Compose file. And once you have a Docker Compose file, starting your app is as easy as Docker Compose up. So all those commands that we put in the in building the image and running the container, all of those options are in the Docker Compose file itself. So now we just do Docker Compose up and Docker Compose does all of the stuff and then your app's running. Uh, detach mode with the dash D, just like we saw. If you want to rebuild uh, up the first time, it's going to build and run your app. If you need to rebuild, you have to specify build. Or a nice shortcut, docker compose up dash dash build is going to rebuild and run the container. All right, oh, and I'm one minute over. So have a great day. See you Wednesday.